I will call the people to him. It's my words. Then I went down to the Father's house. And behold, he walked a word on the wheel. And the dust that he made his place are in the hand of a pot. For he made of man another dust that seemed good to be pot high. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Poor house of Israel, can I find who wait as the Father is wrong? Behold, as your place is in the Father's hand, so are you in my house of Israel. And there went a great mother to with him. And he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brother and sister, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doeth not have this thought and come after me shall not be. For well, which of you continue to build a house who did not have a first and time to cause whether he had a fish fish thing? What's happening after he had laid a foundation and is not able to finish all that he holds it began to mock? Say, this man began to build, build, and will not even. Or what king going to make war against another king? Who does not die first and confess whether he is the Gentile who leaves him that coming against him or the other guy? Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he says, man, that and he has an entire condition of peace. So, likewise, whosoever we be on him. They were not all that he has. We cannot be my disciple. Word of God, but Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 You know, I found out a long time ago that, you know, you, when I was a, a counselor in the military, I found out that there's a big difference when uh, a couple actually love each other. <laughs> it's a whole different world because the things they say to them, the things, how they treat each other, how they act towards each other, how they even talk to each other Amen. is much different when they actually love each other. Oh, yes. Yes. It's a lot easier to make suggestions when somebody actually loves each other. Oh, yeah. yeah. But when they don't love each other, oh Lord, everything you look at the way they, even how they sit next to each other on the couch, leaning away from each other. When whatever comes out of one person's mouth, the other one is like, oh, I'm so stupid. It's like, I, I don't even like the way you breathe. Look, I breathe in and out, in and out, in and out. Everything is wrong, but you know something is something a completely different. When you really love each other, uh, you know, some, some of us have to think way back. Oh, oh Lord, <laughs> now, Pastor. But when you really love each other, you remember those, those conversations where you just talk to them and you forget about time. Right. You, you didn't care where right. you were. You didn't just walking along the beach, or it didn't have to be the highest in restaurant, Michelle Arrington Myers, but you know, you just, really, just wanted to be in each other's party. If we just eat so many crackers, oh man, well, I tell you, they were just the best 
crackers I ever ate. Those were just regular crackers. You were just so in love. <laughs> and what I'm trying to say, it really, really makes a difference when you are in love with somebody. Oh, yeah. I've also found out as a pastor that it makes a difference when you are surrounded by folks who really love the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Because when we're talking about having thine own way, you see, God doesn't have to pull service out of you. When you really love the Lord, you just can't wait to serve because you know it pleases him. It makes God happy. It puts a smile on God's face. You don't want to just be blessed, but God, how can I bless you today? Those are the folks who really, really love the Lord. You just want to be in the presence of God. Yeah. You understand why Mary wasn't so crazy about working that day. Because she was in the presence of Jesus. And I just wanted to sit at his feet and look at him as he talked. I just love what he talked about. He talked about what is he talking about? He's just so awesome. He's amazing. He just heals people. He fills us. He gives us water that we're never thirsty again. I just, what, what does he have to say today? That is how you really are when you love the Lord. You come to church not just because you have to, but just because you just want to spend another time in His presence surrounded by other people who love Him. Because when you try to be like that on your job, what do they do? <laughs> Save it for Sunday, Reverend Brinson. Come on. It don't take all that. It don't take all that for you because you haven't been set on fire like I have. Here. All right, y'all came for a sermon. Let's go ahead and say y'all going to get to the end. All right, amen. Today I want to talk to you about the cost of discipleship. And I, I, one of the things that really uh, hit me, those of you who received my weekly email, I pointed out the fact that uh, it was, it was, I think it was sometime this year or sometime last year where uh, a few young men were getting arrested and uh, I just noticed that as the police officers were putting their head uh, down into the car, they just yelled at the camera, you know, follow me on Instagram and, and Twitter and all that, and it really struck me. They were more interested in gaining followers and drawing attention to themselves than they were being concerned that they were being loaded up into jail. Like the path that they were on, that was what many of us older folks were thinking about. The path that this young man is being set on is going to end up in destruction because we know that when you are in that path in that criminal lifestyle and you don't care about jail anymore, then you know eventually is is, is going to be a never ending cycle of jail, sometimes the hospital, eventually the grave. But many of them they don't even they don't even care. They don't think they're going to live long anyway. I've heard so many of these young gangsters talk about, oh, well, I didn't expect to be 30 or 40 anyway. So in that moment, he just wanted some temporary excitement by gaining followers, thinking if more people see this and see how gangster I am, they're going to look me up on social media and be followers. And you see this all this this big trend nowadays about influencers, and all you need to do is get your numbers up because that gives you more influence, it gives you more power, and hopefully more money as advertisers want to use your page to sell their products. Amen. They don't care about you, they want to sell what they have to sell. But it's hard to argue with some of these young people when they have a million followers. I don't even know a million people. But they got millions of followers and they're called influencers. And that's all it is about how many people are following me. And in my email, I also 
share it with you that I've seen that same trend even with pastors. They go around in some of these church conventions and they're talking about how many members I got in my church. Yeah, oh, I heard the members of the book. Oh, yeah, I, I got over 500. Oh, really? Oh, I remember when I had 500 uh, 30 years ago. I'm up to a thousand now. And it's, it's like they're, they're, they're all excited about how many members. And I remember one pastor, he was one of those classic meddlers. He asked, well, how many of those members actually show up on Sunday morning? And the guy who just said a thousand, well, you know, we have about 300 that actually show up on the sun. On the sun. See, he was more concerned about numbers as opposed to the quality numbers of loyal people who are actually in the seats, actually contributing to the health of the church, working along, and not just three people working in the whole church. It is a healthy church. Of mature disciples. We see in scriptures, Old Testament and New Testament, that God is not just interested in followers, not just numbers. He wants disciples. Amen. We are in the United Methodist Church. Our mission is making what? Disciples, not just building numbers, but disciples for Jesus Christ, for the transformation of the world. You see, if you're just worried about numbers, you're not transforming, you're conforming. Because if I conform to the flavor of the day, I'll get more numbers. Because I get more, I'm more popular with more people. So if I'm just concerned about numbers, I'm going to keep conforming because I want you to like me, I want you to like me, I want you to like me, you to like me, and you to like me. So I got to compromise every, every time. But it's, if I'm more concerned about disciples, yeah. then I want to be a transforming presence in your life. Amen? Right. Amen. So that I can not only find you the way you are, but like Jesus, I love you too much to leave you like you are. Come on, somebody. Right. That's what true transformation is. But Jesus, so in our New Testament scripture, we find uh, in Luke chapter 14, large crowds, large multitudes were traveling with him. But I guess he understood their spirits and why they were following him because he once confronted the crowd in John chapter 6 and said, you're following me not because you were transformed because of the miracles that you have seen. You are following me because you got a hold of some of those loaves and fishes and your bellies were filled. And he understood that sometimes people follow him to get their blessing. Come on, somebody. But when the blessings don't come as fast as they want them to, or in the way that they want to, then they don't follow the Lord anymore. And Jesus got tired of turning around and seeing some tiny folks. You remember my old joke about our song to God is great as thy faithfulness, but often when I were following him, it's great as our flakiness. And God says, I'm tired of having a whole crowd of flaky folks following me that I can't rely on. But I've learned that those who are willing to pay the price for discipleship, we are those road dogs who go with me and do the storm, through the valley and the shadow of death. They are still with me because they are warriors who are not afraid. Why? Because they've been with me in the battle and through the battle and the, facing the gates of hell. They were with me. They learned to pay the cost. So they are my disciples. And whoever does not carry their cross, he said, cannot be my disciple. They may want to. They may have a will to. They may even pray to. But if you don't learn to carry your cross, 
you cannot be. And I love the image on the front page of our bulletin this morning. You notice that each and every one of them are carrying a cross, but they're not only just carrying a cross, but each one of them is carrying a different cross, right? You see that? Because the cross that God has for Sister Myers, God does not have for Sister Brinson. God does not have for Brother McCrary. God had a cross designed for you and your life. But like little trill children, sometimes we find ourselves comparing crosses and talking about, well, well, well my cross is heavier than yours. Well, because God knew I couldn't carry all that. And God won't give me any more than I can bear. God does not judge me by how heavy your cross is. God just judges me by, am I faithfully carrying my cross? So let's stop judging each other by how heavy and how big and how expensive your gold, your cross may be gold plated, mine may be old wood, but as long as I'm being faithful to what God gave me, then God is going to one day say, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been what? Faithful over a few things. You've been faithful for what I gave, gave you to bear. Yes, yes. That's the cost yes. of discipleship. Often we may be in a form or shape that we may not like. And God says, can I be the potter in your life? Can I determine the path in your life? I see a plan. I see a path forward that you may not be able to see right now. But part of the whole idea of the cross is sacrifice. Amen? Amen. On the cross, Jesus, what? He sacrificed his life. Because remember a couple of weeks ago, I told you he was able to endure the cross because he saw the joy that was set before him. He sees the joy that is set before you. He doesn't just see the cross that you are in now. He does not just see the sacrifices that he, he, you are making right now that he's asked you to make, but he sees the benefit of it. There's a burden of the cross, but there's also the benefit of the cross. And if you can just hold on just a little while longer. You see, when the children of Israel got left Egypt, they were all excited until they figured out how long and how hot that journey was. And how sometimes you may be a little hungry. They were so hungry, they actually went back in their minds and in their spirits to their days of slavery and said, if we may have been slaves, but wasn't those onions and watermelons and, and the way Mama fried the chicken and each other, wasn't that pretty good? And God says, you, you, are you this quickly forgetting all the prayers that you once prayed to get out of that situation. Yeah. And now that you are on the right path, right. heading in the right direction, yeah. because that path has got a little difficult, yeah. you are already ready to go back to the very thing you used to pray fast and cry out not long to get out of. Now you see why Jesus is so frustrated with flaky followers? Well, Lord, let us not be a flaky follower. <laughs> if you look at some of the other parts of our lectionary verses today, we read two of them, Jeremiah and Luke, but I didn't read Deuteronomy chapter 30, where God was saying to his people, I have set before you this day, life and prosperity, death and adversity. What was he doing? He was confronting the crowd once again and said, listen, you need to choose life, Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. You need to make a choice. This flaky spirit that you have where you are not willing to pay the cost of discipleship 
is leading to your death. This is why you are so frustrated and you are so disgusted. But he said, I want you to choose the right path. And that path is loving the Lord your God, walking in his ways, observing his commandments, decrees, and ordinances, and then you shall live and become numerous. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are about to possess. I love the way God says, let me tell you, before you even get there, let's talk about a few things. All right. I know that's your goal, but you know, sometimes there are some people who they're not ready for their blessings. Amen. If God blesses them too soon, they're not going to be ready. They're going to forget all about God. Oh, we hear that. We don't need to keep going to church and all that stuff. We hear that. I'm blessed. I'm highly favored. And they forget all about God. So God said, before you go, I need you to choose life as a lifestyle, as a path. And he said also in Psalm 1, another part of our lectionary verses for this week, happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path that sinners tread. Once again, he's talking about a path because those who take their delight in the law of God and, and meditate on his law day and night, they are like trees planted by the streams of water. They yield its fruit in its season and their leaves do not wither. How many of y'all want to be refreshed even in the times of desert? Amen. He said, in all that they do, they prosper. But he says you have to learn how to carry your cross. Oh, yes. And I, here is, I want to explain the example because some of us get a little nervous with some of the words that Jesus said when he said you got to learn how to hate your father, mother, wife, children, brother, sister, even your own life. What he was saying is don't put anyone above God. Yeah. But that does not mean God is going to put you against your mother or father. Otherwise, he would not have said, honor your mother and your father. The first commandment was promise. He wants you to love them, but just don't put them above God. Because there's going to be some times when mother and father forsake you. But then the Lord will take you up. Because God will never leave you. God will never forget you. You are your brother's keeper. So he's not saying to hate your brother, hate your sister. He wants us to love even our own life. He gave us life. So when he said, don't even love your own life, what he is saying, are you willing to give your life for me? Oh, yes. You know I would never demand it unless I had something mighty in store for you. But are you willing to pay the cost of the disciple? Oh, yes. Suppose one of you, he says, wants to build a tower. Why don't you first sit down and count the cost to see if you have enough com to complete it? What is he saying? There's going to be times when God is going to ask you to build something that you don't have enough to build. You don't have enough in your bank account. And they told you what the down payment and what the weekly mortgage, the monthly mortgage is going to be. And you're going to say, well, God, I guess we're not going to be building that, are we? But the cost of the discipleship means you believe me so much that if I tell you to build, you will build. You will plan on it because you know that God will supply all my needs, not according to my bank account, and thank God for that, but according to his riches in glory. Verse 31, or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king, and won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men on my side and 20,000 on the other side. 
What is God saying? There's going to be some battles that you, that God is asking you to fight, and you don't have enough soldiers on your side. But God says, says don't back down, because they're going to come against you with, with chariot and horses, but you're going to come against them in the name of the Lord. And you will win, but you got to fight them, because that's the cost of discipleship. See, discipleship means you will count the cost. Yeah. And you're going to find that often you just don't have enough. But don't you know that grace is when you reach the end of your rope and you have reached as far as you could, God will give you an extension. Yes, it will. Oh, yeah. Yes. When you at the end of your ability yes. and God gives you that little extra, yeah. that is what grace is about. Oh. And when I tell people, remember, only when God tells you. You see, Peter, he was able to walk on the water for a little while, wasn't he? Because he said, Lord, can I come? Peter didn't just get out there, oh, I can do it too. <laughs> he would have went straight to the bottom before Jesus was even able to walk on the Somebody may go get him. Let me get, let me get a fish to bring him back up. But Peter said, Lord, can I come? And Jesus said a one word answer that made the difference. He said, come. Peter didn't just walk on the water. Peter walked on that one word. And when God gives you a word, that is what you stand on. That water could not and still cannot hold the weight of Peter, but just a word from the Lord will hold you up in the midst of a crazy situation. The cost of discipleship is believing that God it will do exactly what he said he will do in your life. You will count the cost, and I guarantee you there are going to be times when you will, will be found wanting. You will be found lacking. But if God gives you that word, stand on it. And God will do beautiful things. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for the example that you've given to us in the word. And Lord, so many times we were like those young men just wanting to be surrounded by numbers, by followers. We thought we were influencers and important people because of how many people were behind us. But God, I thank you for the example of Jesus who knew that everybody who's behind you is not for you. Hey, Some hey. of them are behind you because they can't wait for you to fall so that they can take your place. But God, I thank you, Lord, for the example of Jesus who confronted them and said, I don't want just numbers. I want a relationship with you. I Amen. want to transform you so that you can be my disciples so that when I am gone from this earth, you can still do what I am doing. You can still and greater things will you do than I even did because I'm going to be in you with the power of the Holy Ghost. And you will do great things to the glory of God if you will allow me to transform you into disciples. There may be times where you will pay a price. There is a cost. But I ask right now, yeah. if you really love me, yeah. whether I'm filling your belly right now, whether your the answer to your prayer is happening as quickly as you want it to or not, you're going to be my solid disciples. You will be intentional, you will be consistent, and you will forever walk on the path that I have created for you because that is the cross that I have for you. That is the cross. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I ask that you would do like David said and allow God to search your heart. To search your heart and see what is in there. 
to see whether you are the faithful and loyal and trustworthy disciple that he intended you to be. Or you, like so many of us today, are struggling in your faithfulness to God. You realize that you are knocked off your path way too often because of what's happening in your life. And when things don't go your way the way you want them to go, are you still remaining faithful? Psalm 139 says, Oh Lord, you have searched me and you have known me. You know when I sit down, you know when I rise up. You discern my very thoughts, yeah. even though you may be far away. Yeah. You search out my path, God. Yeah. Lord, you said that you want to make our path straight and help us along our way. Until that day where we hear your voice, well done, that good and faithful servant. Forgive us, Lord, for allowing the temptations, the trials, the storms of life cause us to remember Egypt and remember slavery and actually insult you enough to reminisce good things about those days and say at least we may have been slaves, but at least we had a job. Forgive us, God, for the foolishness that comes out of our soul. Wash us, oh God. Make us clean. That if you have to, if you find that we are marred vessels in your hands, then Lord, just do like that powder of gold. Break us down. Melt us. Mold us again. And once we become the vessel that you have created us to be, and fill us. And feed us till we want more. God, for everyone who prayed that prayer from their heart, I ask that you begin to do the work of one right now. Fill them and strengthen them and keep them in the center of your will. Guard them against the forces of this world that would attract them. And as you lay on them their cross, let them carry their cross as a sign of their commitment to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I don't want to end this part of the service without giving anyone who would want to the opportunity to join this church. We are about to celebrate 146 years. That means we got some staying power. Think about where this nation was, where this state was. 146 years ago, what we had to face and endure 146 years ago. But that tells me that Bethlehem United Methodist Church has some staying power. Amen. So if you want to be involved and connected to a church and a part of the church that has some real staying power, won't you join Bethlehem? COVID got y'all away, separated from people for so long, you don't want no more. Folks, to join back my head. Don't invite them to air trail. People want to social distance. Uh, we to welcome you. If you want to be a part of this church, please join us. We are always ready to welcome you and make you a part of this and put you to work. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Thank God for you. Lord loves you. The Lord wants to use you. Meet your 
This time we're going to transition into uh, our offering as our ushers are standing and um, they will lead us and guide us on how to give. Uh, as we share during our announcements today, there are so many different ways to give to this ministry and we, we ask for your help. Uh, so as uh, we are all standing at this time, and we ask that you will follow the directions of the ushers and give at the door as they want to 